Welcome to the American Society of Echo E3 lecture series. My name is Lucy Safi and I am Director of Interventional Echocardiography at Hackensack University Medical Center and Chair of the ASC Emerging Echo Enthusiasts, also known as E3 Special Interest Group. This special interest group provides an opportunity for early career physicians, sonographers, and trainees who are interested in echocardiography to present, interact, and discuss echocardiographic topics. Each lecture is formatted as a 30-minute didactic lecture followed by a panel discussion. On the panel will be two moderators and an expert in the field. During the discussion section, the panelists will also answer audience questions, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box below. This virtual lecture series will be recorded and later available online via the ASC E3 website. To join ASC E3 Special Interest Group, Log into your ASC account and under Update My Profile, click Specialty Interest Groups and then click E3. Today's lecture is the third lecture in the Structural Heart Mini series on the topic of aortic valve interventions. Joining me today as co-moderator is Dr. Tiffany Chen. Dr. Chen is an assistant professor of clinical medicine at the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania, where she is also a multimodality imager who practices interventional echocardiography, cardiac CT, and cardiac MRI. She did her internal medicine residency at Brown University, cardiology fellowship at the University of Washington, and advanced cardiovascular imaging at University of Pennsylvania. She serves on the ASC Image Guide Echo Registry Committee and is on the writing group for the updated prosthetic valve guidelines. Welcome, Dr. Chen, and thank you for joining me today as a co-moderator. Thank you, Lucy. Our physician expert today is Dr. Jeremy Thaden. Dr. Thaden is an echocardiographer and consultant in cardiovascular disease at Mayo Clinic, where he also serves as the co-chair for clinical practice and quality within the Division of Cardiovascular Ultrasound. He is an, involved in interoperative TEE, interventional echocardiography, and the Valve Clinic specialty practice, where his interests include 3D echo, quantitative echo, and the utilization of echo to improve patient outcomes. He is currently serving on, on the 2022 ASC Scientific Sessions Planning Committee as the co-chair for the perioperative echocardiography track. Thank you for joining us today as our expert panelist, Dr. Thaden. Thank you, Tiffany. Appreciate it. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Mahesh Vadula. Dr. Vadula is currently an advanced imaging fellow at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his undergraduate degree in bioengineering from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and his medical degree from Northwestern University. He completed his internal medicine residency at the Massachusetts General Hospital and his general cardiology fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania where he also served as Chief Cardiology Fellow. Welcome, Dr. Vadula. We look forward to your presentation. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you all for the opportunity to, uh, to present this evening. Um, I'll be presenting about echocardiography for a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So uh, in this presentation, I specifically wanted to cover the applications of echocardiography for uh, pre-procedural assessment, intra-procedural guidance, and post-procedural monitoring. I'll also have some cases sprinkled throughout. And so with that, we'll start with the uh, introduction. Uh, so uh, as, as many of you know, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or, or known as, as uh, TAVR, is a percutaneous, less invasive alternative to surgery for patients with symptomatic aortic stenosis. It is a, currently approved for patients who are inoperable or at high, intermediate, or low surgical risk. In terms of volume, a recent study that came out of Jack um, showed that TAVR volume has begun to exceed all forms of SAVR. There are two main types of valves that are used in TAVR. So one is the self-expanding valves, which are shown here, which are the Medtronic core valve and Evolute valves. And two are the balloon expandable valves, which are shown here. And these are the Edward Sapien valves. The valves on the right hand side here are the latest generation. Please note that these valves have a fabric skirt located where the valve interacts with the annulus, which provides a better seal at that location and prevents paravalvular leak. In the Sapien 3 valve, the fabric skirt is actually on the, mounted on the outside of the frame to minimize paravalvular leak. And we'll go into more about par paravalvular leak later in the presentation. In terms of access, 
TAVR is uh, primarily performed with transfemoral access, but other forms of access are also options, such as uh, transaortic, transcarotid, subclavian, or even transapical. Now we can move into the uh, use of echocardiography and other imaging modalities for the pre-procedural assessment of patients. So the first part of the pre-procedural assessment is to establish the diagnosis and severity of aortic stenosis. Here, transthoracic echocardiography is, is really key. Um, transthoracic echo is also critical to identify appropriate candidates for the procedure and characterize other cardiac consequences of aortic stenosis on the heart, such as LVRV function and other valve lesions. One study that's shown here looked at the prognostic impact of a staging classification that was based on the extent of cardiac damage in patients with aortic stenosis and found that the extent of cardiac damage was independently associated with increased mortality uh, um, after AVR. Therefore, it is key to understand the extent of cardiac remodeling due to aortic stenosis in patients undergoing workup for TAVR. And here, transthoracic echo really is key. Imaging is also really essential to understand the anatomy of the aortic valve complex as part of the pre-procedural assessment, since these can have implications for the, procedure, uh, for, for the procedure and help with procedural planning. It is very important to characterize the aortic valve anatomy and understand the morphology, the number of cuffs, and the location and extent of calcification because those, those all impact the procedure. The left ventricular outflow tract should also be examined very thoroughly and carefully with understanding of the morphology and whether there is baseline LVOT obstruction or septal hypertrophy, since these can complicate the deployment of the valve. Calcification is very important to, cal to, to look at as well for, in both the aortic valve and the LVOT, since it is a predictor for paravalvular leak and aortic trauma. And for examination of the aortic valve and left ventricular outflow tract, you can use either transthoracic echo, 3DT, or CT. Moving on, the annulus must be very carefully measured since these measurements are the most important for sizing of the valve. Specifically, we're very interested in the annular perimeter, area, and diameter. And for this, CT or 3DT is, is, is typically used for the measurements, and I'll go into more detail about why that is. The aortic root must also be measured very carefully and examined for any underlying aortic pathology that may complicate the deployment of the valve. Furthermore, the uh, location of the coronary ostia must be identified and the height of the coronary ostia from the annulus must be known to determine the risk of coronary occlusion. A low coronary height, which is typically thought of as less than 12 millimeters, increases the risk for coronary occlusion and CT or 3D TE are required for accurate measures of this, of this parameter as well. So moving into the aortic annulus, um, accurate measurements of the aortic annulus are critical for appropriate sizing of the prosthetic valve. That's because oversizing can lead to annular rupture, underexpansion of the valve, and conduction issues. Undersizing can lead to paravalvular leak, prosthetic valve instability, or even embolization. The anatomy of the aortic annulus is very interesting and is, uh, it, it's, it's known as a virtual ring in the literature. As shown in the picture here, the aortic annulus is defined as the plane at the level of the hinge points, which are the lowest attachment sites of the three cusps. This can be tough to accurately measure since the annulus is typically oval. Therefore, the, the smallest dimension of the aortic annulus is actually in the sagittal plane and the largest is in the coronal plane. And so cross-sectional measurements are really critical for the most accurate characterization of the aortic annulus. CT is the gold standard for annular sizing. Um, with CT, you can identify the annular plane using multiplanar reformats and obtain the area, perimeter, and diameters. These measurements are typically done in systole when the annulus is at, at its largest. You can also quantify the amount and location of calcium, which is very important for procedural planning. So here in this image on, on the left is an image taken from the uh, SECT guidelines about how to use CT for, for TAVR planning. And then here's an example from our, um, from our own CT at, at the University of Pennsylvania, where we perform these measurements for a uh, patient who was undergoing a TAVR evaluation. With CT, um, you can also obtain measurements of the heights of the coronary ostia, which as we touched on before is, uh, is very important in order to determine the risk for coronary occlusion. 
Uh, CT can also help characterize other risk factors for coronary obstruction, such as a long bulky cusp or a very small sinus of Valsalva, such as um, uh, less than 30 millimeters. However, uh, there are limitations to CT, including exposure to radiation, the need for IV contrast, uh, which can be problematic in patients with renal injury, uh, and there can also be gating and motion artifacts. And in those cases, uh, 3DT may be useful to obtain these, these measurements. And so uh, here's an example of where 3DTE can also be used for sizing. And 3DTE does yield measurements that are comparable to those from CT. Um, and so this can be an especially useful tool for patients who may not be able to undergo a CT. You can acquire a 3D data set and use multiplanar reformats to obtain accurate annular measurements as seen here, where we're able to get a characterization of the annulus. In this patient here, the reason they underwent 3D uh, a TE instead of a CT was that they had renal injury and therefore could not undergo a CT. But of course, even with 3D TE, there are artifacts that can occur, such as side lobe artifacts and dropout that may complicate these measurements. In addition, um, you can use 3D TE uh, to get the height of the coronary ostia from the annulus as well using uh, the, the multiplanar reformats, as shown in the example here, where we're, here's the annular plane, and we're able to measure the height of the coronaries from the annulus using TE. Now we'll move into the use of echo and imaging for interprocedural guidance. So um, while TE was used for interprocedural guidance when TAVR was just beginning, uh, now fluoroscopy has been the main imaging tool utilized in TAVR. TE may still be used in complex cases or in cases with uh, transapical, uh, tran transapical access, but it's not used routinely and requires general anesthesia. However, uh, echo can be useful during the procedure. Uh, for example, uh, prior to the valve being deployed, either TTE or TE can be used to confirm the, um, uh, look at the annulus again, evaluate the aortic valve complex, and confirm the positioning of the catheters in the prosthetic valve. Once the valve has been deployed, echo can be used to image the valve position and shape, evaluate the valve function, and um, look for regurgitation. And very importantly, echo can be used to quickly and efficiently evaluate for, for procedural complications, such as acute valvular issues, where either the, um, the prosthetic aortic valve uh, may malfunction, or uh, the mitral valve may have been injured um, during implantation of, of, of the valve and due to the TAVR hardware. You can also evaluate for tamponade, LV dysfunction, RV dysfunction, and wall motion abnormalities that may suggest coronary obstruction and also look for aortic trauma, including signs suggestive of annular rupture. So here's a case from uh, one of my very first CCU calls uh, where I was called about a patient who was hypotensive after, uh, after a TAVR. Um, she was an 88-year-old woman uh, with severe AS who had just undergone placement of a number 26 Evolute Pro who developed hypertension acutely after deployment of the valve. Um, and thinking about what, her, what may have been causing her hypotension, there are a variety of causes. Um, this can include you know, acute prosthetic aortic valve issues, such as the displacement of the valve, um, a frozen leaflet, or acute aortic regurgitation. Vascular issues were certainly on, on the differential as well, such as a, a retroperitoneal bleed from access site, um, uh, from, from accessing the, the site, and then as well as a uh, aortic dissection or an annular rupture. You also have to think about tamponade, coronary obstruction, or injury to the mitral valve apparatus. As part of her workup, she underwent an echocardiogram, which is shown here, which I'll play. And she didn't have the greatest windows, but these images showed an underfilled hyperdynamic LV with mid-cavity obstruction. and she had a peak gradient of 52 millimeters mercury. So this patient had obstructive physiology after TAVR, and this phenomenon is known as a, su a suicide LV. After TAVR, patients with severe aortic stenosis have an abrupt decrease in afterload that leads to an acute improvement in LV systolic and, and diastolic parameters, leading to obstructive physiology. The obstructive physiology can be exacerbated if the patient has asymmetric hypertrophy, hypovolemia, and a hypercontractile LV. This condition is treated by giving fluids to maintain normal filling pressures, slowing down the heart rate to allow increased filling time, decreased inotropy, 
in avoiding after uh, reducing medications. And in, that and, and in this patient, that's exactly what we did. We gave fluids and uptitrated a beta blocker and she did much better. And finally, we can um, uh, move into the use of echo in imaging for post-procedural monitoring. And this is where echo is, uh, once again, very critical uh, So uh, for the post-procedural imaging of, of these patients. Echo can evaluate the valve position and shape to ensure stability can evaluate valve function by measuring the gradients and examining leaflet motion. Echo is also key in the evaluation of aortic regurgitation and identifying the presence, location, and severity of the regurgitation. It's also important um, to look for wall motion abnormalities to evaluate for coronary patency, identify any additional cardiac conditions. And if there is hemodynamic compromise of the patient, echo can be used to look at the biventricular function aortic, um, examine for aortic trauma, look for effusion, and also uh, examine valvular function as well. To evaluate valve function in particular, um, I found this paper by Dr. Hans group to be extremely useful. This paper establishes the normal ranges of gradients, DVI, and effective orifice areas for the balloon expandable and self-expanding valves. To establish these normal parameters, the authors collected core lab measurements of these, uh, of these parameters from, from discharge or 30-day echoes from randomized trials and published these tables of, of, of normal parameters. These tables can be used, um, can be very useful while reading post taver echoes and understanding whether the, the gradients, effective orifice areas, or the DVIs that you are seeing are within the normal ranges. I wanted to make special mention of this. Um, so to, to measure the NEO-LVOT diameter for the calculation of EOA, the authors use the outer to outer stent diameter, which is shown by the blue arrows here. The instant measurement as shown by the red arrows was used if the outer to outer measurements were not well seen or if the valve was implanted in a low position and the frame of the valve protruded into the LV cavity. When looking at post taver valve function, it's very important to look for changes in the mean gradient, EOA, DVI, and also changes in the presence or degree of regurgitation. Increased gradients post taver can occur for a variety of reasons, including inadequate expansion of the valve, the patient may be in, in a high flow state, so they may be anemic, they may have regurgitation, or they may uh, be infected. Um, endocarditis can also cause increased gradients post taver, so can stenosis. So, um, which can be caused by thrombosis, degeneration, or calcification of the valve. And also patient prosthesis mismatch, although this is thought to be less likely due to the um, accurate measurements that are done with, um, of the annulus prior to the procedure. So with that background, we can move into the second case um, of a 59-year-old man who underwent implantation of a number 29 Sapien 3 valve. And I was a first-year fellow when I, uh, when I initially read his echo. So on his uh, post-op day zero echo, uh, he had normal gradients um, and looked like his uh, look, looks like he had no, uh, normal valve function. On his post-op day one echo, again his mean gradient was seven, peak gradient of fourteen with a, with a DVI point four seven, and all of those looked within normal limits as well. And so he felt better and was, uh, was and uh, went home. However, at his six month clinic visit, he started. Uh, uh, saying that he was feeling more short of breath, was feeling fatigued um, for the last month. He also had occasional lightheadedness and some dizziness. And so his cardiologist ordered an echo. And at that time, his mean gradient was 22, his peak gradient was, was 35, and his DVI was 0.23. So we see significant elevation in his gradients from his, from his echoes that were performed immediately prior to his TAVR. Closer review of his echo also showed that the right coronary cusp was slightly restricted with mild increase in echogenicity. And so given these findings, there were concerns for uh, thrombosis of his TAVR, and the patient was referred for a CT. And here is his CT here. Um, his CT showed th thickening of the right coronary cusp and the non-coronary cusp, and less involvement of, of the left coronary cusp. And the CT was read as having normal motion of the cusps. And so given these findings, the patient was diagnosed with hypoattenuated leaflet thickening, also known as HALT. 
And so for this, he was give, started on anticoagulation and his gradients returned back to normal. And so, and his symptoms also improved. And so uh, for those who may be interested, this slide shows a grading strategy for HALT on CT um, based on the thickness of the, of, of, of the leaflet. And finally, we get to one of the most important parts of the imaging evaluation post haver which is evaluation of regurgitation. So prior studies have shown that regurgitation, whether it's uh, total or paravalvular, is associated with increased mortality, as shown here in these figures on the right. Uh, where we see increased mortality in patients who have even mild to severe uh, paravalvular leak versus none or trace. And so risk factors for regurgitation include undersizing of the valve, malposition of the valve, and malapposition of the valve with the surrounding native structures, and the calcium burden as well. Irregularly calcified leaflets or calcium that protrudes into the annulus or LVOT may also increase the risk for regurgitation by causing gaps between the valve and the surrounding structures. Regurgitation can be intravalvular or, or paravalvular. One of the main goals of a post haver echo is to define the presence, location, and severity of paravalvular regurgitation. It is critical to scan the whole valve at multiple levels, since post haver regurgitation can have multiple jets with irregular shapes and, and trajectories. Therefore, it's very important when scanning these patients and, and reading their echoes it, to identify the number of jets, the path of the jets, and whether they truly enter the LV and can be counted as true regurgitation, and the location and the origin of these jets as well. To describe the location and origin, we typically use a clock face notation as seen here in the short axis view. And apical views are critical to obtain since there may be shadowing due to the prosthetic valve in, in the short axis views. And you also get views of the valve and the apical views that, are, that may not be well seen in the, in the parasternal views as well. This figure um, and, the, and the prior figure were both from the AAC guideline document on the evaluation of valvular regurgitation after percutaneous valve repair. And this figure here shows a nice example of, of uh, the limitations of TT and TE. Specifically, it shows the, it's, um, uh, it's a nice example of attenuation on TTE, due, NTE due to the prosthetic valve. On the top panel here, we see that there is posterior attenuation on TTE. And on the bottom panel here, we see that there is anterior attenuation here due to the prosthetic valve. These are the limitations of TTE and TTE that we need to be aware of when uh, reading these echoes and evaluating these, parents, uh, these, these patients for um, paravalvular regurgitation. In the AAC document, there's also a proposed method to grade the severity of paravalvular regurgitation, which is complex and, um, and, and multifactorial as, um, as we'll go through. So they characterize severity based on the integration of several parameters. Two of those parameters are shown here and include the vena contracta area and the percent of circumferential extent of the jet in relation to the total circumference of the prosthetic valve ring. So as shown here, Mild paravalvular regurgitation was defined as less than 10% circumferential extent, moderate as 10 to 30%, and severe as greater than 30% circumferential extent. By vena contracta area, we actually can trace the vena contract of the jet. Mild regurgitation is defined as less than 0.1 centimeter squared, moderate as between 0.1 and 0.3 centimeter squared and severe as greater than 0.3 centimeters squared. There are other uh, parameters on echo that are associated with more severe regurgitation as well. And those include um, a vena contracta width of greater than 0.6 centimeters, flow convergence in the aorta as seen here in this picture. And then flow reversal in the aorta may be present at baseline in patients undergoing TAVR already and it's more useful if it's new compared to the baseline echo. Holodiastolic flow reversal in the abdominal aorta is more specific for significant aortic regurgitation. Overall, uh, in the evaluation of patients with, uh, uh, with paravalvular regurgitation and trying to judge the severity, the colored Doppler parameters are felt to be the most useful compared to other Doppler parameters. Um, uh, for example, there are some limitations with the uh, with these other uh, with these other 
parameters, um, the jet width to LVOT width is limited due to the eccentric nature of, of the jets. Continuous wave Doppler spectral density may be limited in the presence of multiple jets that you may see in a patient. And the pressure half time may be limited if there are pre-existing uh, compliance abnormalities. You can also quantify the regurgitant volume and fraction um, in order to, as a, another parameter to help uh, figure out the severity of the regurgitation. And you can also perform 3D uh, planimetry of the vena contracted area to do so as well. And all of those parameters are integrated into the ASC guideline document where they have a, they, where they present an integrative approach of these parameters. And here's the diagram that, that they published. Um, the, one of the big things to note is that they care, uh, classify patients into three categories, mild, moderate, and severe. And these guidelines take, in, take into account many of the parameters we just talked about, such as vena contracta size, circumferential extent, uh, vena contracta area, and um, they recommend using quantitative parameters in intermediate cases to better define the severity. And in cases with truly indeterminate aortic regurgitation, the guidelines recommend T or CMR for further quantification. Recently, uh, the Valve Academic Research Consortium published an updated grading method for paravalvular regurgitation that also takes into, many, uh, into account many of the parameters that were just talked about in the ASC guideline. I won't go into this in much detail, but I wanted to um, post it for your reference and also bring up a few points. One big thing to note is that they do, that, the, that these guidelines do bring up a five class grading scheme where there are not only mild, moderate to severe categories, but also mild to moderate and moderate to severe categories. And if you take a look here, you can also see that there, may, there are many of the same parameters that we discussed earlier, such as vena contracta width, vena contracta area, um, and circumferential extent. This slide here has the more qualitative and semi-quantitative parameters. Um, and also another big thing to note is that uh, the circumferential extent and the vena contracta area cutoffs are similar to the ones that were presented in the ASC guidelines. And this slide here has the more quantitative parameters, including regurgitant fraction and also regurgitant fraction by CMR. So I wanted to wrap up with a uh, case of paravalvular, uh, paravalvular regurgitation that was repaired here at the University of Pennsylvania. Leaks are typically thought to um, uh, be repaired if there is evidence of heart failure or if there's significance of hemolysis. So this here is a 66-year-old woman with a history of severe AS who underwent TAVR with a number 29 Evolute Pro. On her post-TAVR follow-up, she was experiencing some shortness of breath, and on her echoes, she was noted to have some paravalvular regurgitation. And so here is her parasternal long axis view, where we see the jet of paravalvular regurgitation, and it's more and it's uh, was noted to be posterior, and we see that again also in the short axis view. So with that, and here's another view of that as well. We see the jet here being. And then here are the T images uh, showing the moderate posterior uh, paravalvular regurgitation as well. We see the jet here. And I'll play this one as well. And then you know, one last color compare picture here showing the paravalvular regurgitation in this location. So given those images and her symptoms, um, she uh, underwent paravalvular leak closure. And these are images after the leak was closed after placement of an Amplatzer vascular plug for um, eight millimeter closure device. So here now um, on TE, we don't see that leak anymore. I'm showing that the uh, regurgitation had resolved after her, um, after the, the procedure. So this was successful closure of that paravalvular leak. So finally, um, here's some take home messages regarding echo and other imaging modalities in TAVR. So for the pre-procedural assessment, TT is critical to establish the diagnosis of aortic stenosis and CT and 3D TE are essential for accurate sizing. So for interprocedural guidance, echo can help with valve positioning in tough cases and also identify complications in a timely manner. 
As for post-procedural monitoring, echo is critical for the characterization and monitoring of valve function. And the characterization of paravalve regurgitation requires integration of multiple parameters. Additional imaging with CT or CMR may be required to further assess valve function in, in, um, in cases where echo may not be sufficient. And with that, I just want to thank you all for joining. Um, here is my contact information. And also obviously want to thank Tiffany, Lucy, Jeremy, and Danielle for uh, the invitation and for organizing this session. And uh, very much looking forward to the panel. Thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. Um, and what great cases. Um, I would love to actually review some of those cases because I think there's a lot of teaching points on them. Um, but I wanted to actually start off uh, by asking our expert today, Dr. Thane, and a couple of questions. I know that you have interest in uh, quantification and also quality metrics. And uh, as we do more and more low risk patients, I think the importance for identifying and quantifying paravalvular leak is um, you know, at the top of our list. So how do you approach quantification of a post taver valve? Thank you, Lucia, yeah, and, and that was a fantastic uh, presentation, Mahesh. I, I thought that was really kind of really illustrative cases and kind of brought in some really important um, points. So, um, so as, as Mahesh pointed out, it, with ECHO, it's a multi-parametric approach, and so it, we're we're sort of integrating multiple um, qualitative and semi-quantitative parameters. Um, along with quantitation. So I tend to separate out the periprocedural imaging from the follow-up imaging, in part because I think during the procedure, true quantitation is, is pretty challenging. I mean, most of us are using transthoracic imaging. And so to get, you know, quantitative Doppler, accurate quantitative Doppler on the cath table is, is, is pretty challenging, I think, for, for most of us. So to me, some of the most important parameters periprocedurally to look at um, Mahesh covered, but but I think the four that I think are probably the most useful are number one to look at the stent position and whether ex it's expanded. So as soon as you, you know, that's probably the first thing you do is you know even you look at the at, at the at the fluoroscopy and you look how the deployment went, and then you go to your echo and you say is the stent high or low or is it fully expanded? Because if it's not, if it's in a bad position, or if it's not fully expanded, then to me, at least in my head, you gotta, you gotta look for PVL. It's there until proven otherwise. So you really gotta look hard. Um, the other important thing about that is it can affect what you do next. So if the stent is underexpanded and you find PVL, you're likely gonna go to another balloon to try to expand it further, unless there's a contraindication. If the stent is high or low, then you may not be able to fix it with a balloon expansion because what can happen is the leak can be, if it's really high or low, the leak can be coming from or basically around the skirt. And so sometimes you need a valve in valve with a, you know, a valve that's either a little lower or a little higher if, it, if it's really off position. So again, stent position, stent expansion. And then to me, one of the key measures is that circumferential extent. And it's not perfect but it, you can get it in most patients and it correlates with, with severity. So again, you have to take sweeping views, just like Mahesh said, with transthoracic, you're gonna be shadowed posteriorly. With TE, you're gonna be shadowed anteriorly. So you gotta take sweeping views and make sure you see above and below the valve. Um, and then obviously your apical views are also important to be sure you're not missing something as well. And then I start to look at the the, reversal continuous wave Doppler, so the, the AR continuous wave Doppler. Because if I'm worried about it, you know, that's going to give you a sense of the hemodynamic impact. So, and, and remember, again, Mahesh pointed this out as well. These patients often have small ventricles with concentric hypertrophy. They're non-compliant. And so even sometimes with mo what looks like moderate perivalvular leak, you can see a very short pressure halftime. But I think that's also important because these patients probably aren't going to tolerate moderate PVL much because they have small non-compliant ventricles. They're going to have high pressure even with moderate leaks. Um, and then I go to the flow reversals in the aorta. Um, you know, looking for a change pre and post. And again, that the issue is, in particular in elderly patients, they can have flow reversals to begin with without any AR. And so you try to look and see if it's changed between preoperatively and postoperatively. 
So it, it's, it's really, I mean, it's an integration of multiple parameters to come to a final grade. Excellent. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's definitely not straightforward. And, um, you know, one of the things that we comment on even at our MDT meetings is also the location and presence of calcium. And so if we do see a lot of calcium, we worry about both paravalvular leak and injury to the aortic root. Um, and, you know, if we see a lot of calcium in the leak around the calcium, then we're hesitant to balloon um, in order to treat that paravalvular leak. You know, one of the things I find challenging, and I would love to hear the panelists' opinion, is that when, you know, we're pivoting more and more towards transthoracic assessment for PBL on the table um, and less use of TEE. So, you know, when a patient is sterilely draped uh, and the sonographer or the cardiologist has limited access to the chest, where, you know, which views do you think are the highest yield for the sonographers on the line? Uh, which views do you recommend uh, to assess the paravalvular leak? Yeah, that, that's a great question and a great point. Um, I think, you know, um, oftentimes we do see a little bit more PVL on the day one uh, transthoracic and um, that, you know, wasn't seen on the immediately post-procedure transthoracic. Um, or we are pretty much just doing parasternal and um, some limited apical views. Um, and um, I think um, you point out that it has implications in terms of missing paravalvular leak, um, but I also think we um, have a tendency um, uh, to underestimate gradients um, immediately post, in part because of loading conditions um, and maybe a low float state. It's been described, um, but there's a dramatic increase in gradients um, um, that we see on, 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 on the first day. Um, and it may also have to do with, um, with windows. Um, and I know, Jeremy, you have a lot of thoughts on, on, on you know, um, I think you had a paper on, you know, looking at different <laughs> um, windows to search for the, for the um, you know, the most accurate gradients, and it actually makes quite a difference. So I'll let you comment on that. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, on the table, it, it's tough. I mean, the patient's lying flat on their back. Imaging is challenging, um, and you're not able to reposition them to get a better image. And and really, you can't get right parasternal uh, or or other imaging. Very at least at least we don't haven't had much success with that on the cath lab table. So, and we have the same experience. Gradients are significantly lower in the cath lab than that post op day one. Um, so. I think it's probably a variety of reasons that you alluded to, you know, the angle, you know, the angulation issue, probably, I mean, probably a cardiac output issue. Um, so the views, I, I think that we find most useful for PVL, we usually start parasternal, uh, parasternal long to look for the stent position, and then we'll flip into a parasternal short. And then that gives us the, the sort of the uh, circumferential extent. And then we're really careful to try to do sweeping views. So I'm, I'm usually asking, hey, can you tilt down into the LVOT? Because we really want to see, you know, what it looks like below the stent and then, and then also at that ventricular level to make sure we're not missing anything. And then often what we'll do is just like Tiffany said, we'll go to the apical views and we'll look, and that's a double check to make sure we're not missing, particularly with transthoracic, that we're not missing a posterior leak. So we'll look there. And with some of the newest imaging systems, the frame rates are good enough that you can sometimes even do a biplane. You can do simul simultaneous biplane with color, and you can sometimes even just walk the cursor up and down the stent frame and sort of get another sense of, of whether there's leak there. It's obviously imperfect. I mean, TE would give us better resolution, but, but in most patients, it probably gives us the answer we need. And then I would say in a minority of cases where we're not sure, I mean, some of those cases we decide to convert to T preoperatively. If it's post, you know, post deployment, and we start, just start seeing what we want to see, then we can either convert to T, or sometimes we're um, we're shooting aortic root angiograms just to give us a little more reassurance uh, in some of those cases. Yeah, that's great. Um, I actually have a follow up to that in terms of both, both for Lucy and Jeremy, um, in terms of how do you guys decide um, nowadays who, who, who you plan to do interop TE um, versus transthoracic? You know, is it all your basilica cases where, um, or, you know, your valve and valve cases, or um, is it more like patient factors that you guys are 
um, basing that decision on in your heart team? Yeah, um, I don't know, Lucy, you want to you start? Or... Yeah, um, um, you know, it's a, it's a multidisciplinary discussion during our presentations, but I can say that more often than not, we're doing these cases conscious sedation. It's only the higher risk patients that we will, you know, consider T for and exactly the, you know, the patient profile that you mentioned, you know, if it's a high risk valve and valve um, or an LVAD or, or, you know, a patient that needs a basilica or advanced treatment, then we would consider a TE. But other than that, I would say most of our patients nowadays are, are conscious sedation. Yeah, we're, we're the same. I mean, I, I, and actually you pointed out some of the common ones. I think alternative access, things like basilica, but otherwise I think a lot of the valve and valves, um, the majority, vast majority of patients are transthoracic and conscious sedation now. Yeah, and that, that's our experience as well. Um, yeah. I mean, sometimes, to be honest, I, I, I wish we did a little more TE. That's my personal bias. I mean, I'm an echo person. Um, and, but that's always a conversation we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I, I, I struggle with that as well. I'd love to be there. Yeah. Um, but then yeah. you also the utilize, utilization of resources. Yep. One that's right. As well, your time. Yep. And it stresses the importance of education for the sonographers who are there and sometimes independently there um, to get these images. And so how, you know, training and, and going back to the, you know, which angles to go for. And, you know, sometimes the short axis of the aortic valve, that gives you the full clock face view and maybe the fastest, easiest way to screen patients if you sweep around uh, the short axis and then go to your apicals and parasternal for supplement information. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree with everyone on the panel that I too miss uh, being in there for the Tavers. Um, so, you know, one thing that we didn't touch too much on, but I think is an important concept is um, patient prosthesis mismatch. You know, we do assess these valves both pre and post and, and Dr. Vadula presented a great paper on expected EOA. You know, on your reports, do you, um, do you often assess the EOA and refer to that paper to see if it's an expected EOA for that patient or if low gradients are good enough? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a good question. In our, in our, um, in our lab, we don't routinely, I mean, we report EOA, um, but we, 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 we put a little more emphasis, I guess, on the gradients as, as of now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I think we also rely more on, say, the dimensionalist index, um, just because the uh, EOA, as you know, has issues with um, sometimes with the LVOT diameter um, measurement, um, as, it, and as Mahesh pointed out, that there may be some variability as to where that's made. Um, but I, I do think, you know, I, I think um, it is important to kind of track uh, across time what the gradients have been doing historically and, it, it, you know, particularly when you encounter high gradients. Um, and also, I think in our reporting, we, you know, have a tendency to report the valve size and type um, in the echo report itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do that as well. Um, and, you know, I think following gradients is a very good point. And I know that Dr. Vadula mentioned that in his presentation as well. Um, you know, one to look for any kind of issues with degeneration with time. But how often are, are you following these post-TAVR patients with echoes? Um, you know, I know you get a post-op day one. But then, you know, I, on follow-up, you know, what is your normal protocol? So um, I'll maybe start because we're we may be a little little bit of an outlier in that we actually got rid of the post-op day one echo. So we we basically image the patients now in the cath lab, um, and if in, in the majority of cases, unless I guess unless there's something specifically we're concerned about, we actually don't get a post-op day one echo anymore. And then we'll image the patient at 30 days, and then we we still at least the TAVR valves we still follow these patients yearly. Um, so it's interesting because I think, you know, the post-op day one um, is, is an interesting echo because I think we don't frequently find a lot of pathology, but it is nice to have that timestamp. So, you know, if, if, because the issue is the gradient, right? So if you have an interprocedural gradient that you know is going to be lower and you have a 30 day echo where the patient is recovered, cardiac output's higher, you get better windows, you know, more aligned windows, 
the gradient inevitably is higher. And so you're always having this debate, you know, do we need to look at the leaflets? Because you, know, you got to see the leaflets. You know, so many of these patients will have subclinical thrombosis. Um, and so that, I think, to me, that getting rid of the, I mean, the patients have done well overall, but getting rid of that post-op day one echo has been a challenge, I think, from that standpoint. Um, but then for longitudinal follow-up, we're still following these patients yearly, um, at least at least for now. Tiffany, what, what is your practice yeah. like? So that, that's very interesting to hear, Jeremy. Um, so, you know, we, we actually looked at our data recently um, and, um, you know, basically saw a big jump in the gradients from day zero to day one and not much change from day one to day 30. Um, so um, it's very interesting. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, we tend to be more of a referral center. So I, I think the, the protocol is to do, you know, day, day zero, day one, day 30, um, and um, uh, one year, but um, they may get the one year echo um, locally. So. Yeah, interestingly, you know, we also do it, you know, the lab transthoracic, and then we do a day one. Um, I find out the 30 day, you can see one of two things. Um, one is either the gradient is stable compared to day one. Um, and again, this is just my, you know, review, uh, personal opinion. Uh, it's either the same or sometimes lower on the day 30. And I think it's because the hemodynamic effects, whether the anesthesia has completely worn off, whether the anemia has resolved, but I find that um, the day 30 is really the true baseline um, as opposed to the day one. And um, the one that I like to refer to when I follow longitudinally. I don't know if anyone else has noticed any any changes in the gradients on the day day thirty. No, I mean we actually did systematically look at this data recently mm -hmm. and um, did not observe a difference. But okay. um, you know, it, it, and it it you know again it speaks to how you're doing the echo, right? You know, um, again searching for the gradients, searching for PBL is is incredibly important at every time point and consistency in, in your approach and methodology. And you know, as these procedures get um, you know, more routine and, and we start to transition from a risk-based assessment to more of an anatomy-based assessment. Um, and as we all agreed, you know, we're doing more and more conscious sedation. Where do you think the role of ECHO is going to be for TAVR in the future? Hard question. <laughs> you mean intra-procedurally or, I, I mean, I think I think you it's know, a diagnostic tool of choice for finding aortic stenosis. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's interesting question. I mean, because there's, I mean, there's, if you look at European, I mean, the, the European experience with TAVR. I remember speaking at a meeting there, and there were centers with, you know, uh, this was a couple of years ago that literally weren't even using intra interprocedural echo. I mean, it was all fluoroscopy based, which I couldn't believe, you know? I, but I think that, you know, I think certainly we're moving towards transthoracic. And I think th there's been gains in image quality over the last couple of years. I, I still think that we can kind of better refine who may, maybe needs a T interprocedurally. But if you look at the list of post-deployment complications that Mahesh put together, I mean, they're all identified by echo. I mean, all of them. And while they are rare, um, many of them are life-threatening. Um, so I don't think it'll ever go away. Um, I, I just think we could probably do a little better job of, of figuring out who might benefit from TE rather than TTE, personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, great. Um, great advice. And, um, you know, I think that that is something that I'm looking forward to see what happens because, you know, I, I never, when TAVR first came out, I never thought that we'd be doing conscious sedation pretty routinely. And now we are. And so I'm curious to see what the next five to 10 years um, have. Um, but I, I do want to talk about the, the halt, the hypotenuated leaflet thickening. I think it's something that I'm not sure if it's, we're finding more of it because we're looking for it for it or if it's something that's always kind of been around and, and not recognized. But, you know, what's your experience with these valves and, and, and HALT? Like, have you been seeing a lot of them? Is it something that we should be checking for more routinely in your opinion? 
my my opinion is yeah i think that we're we're seeing more of it cuz we're finally looking for it i mean i think it was probably there in surgical valves for a long time and maybe was underrecognized um it's interesting i mean the the you know leaflet thrombosis and halt i mean the the sort of the outcomes around the time of it there's sort of conflicting data on whether there's increased risk of thromboembolism or not um but I do, I do honestly worry about the long-term durability, whether a patient with HALT or, or leaflet thrombosis, whether it impacts long-term durability. Um, Soren Pizzler here at Mayo has kind of been a, um, it's one of his interests is, is leaflet thrombosis in surgical and transcatheter valves. And when they looked at our, at least our experience with, with surgical and transcatheter valves, those that had leaflet thrombosis, they didn't necessarily have a high risk of thromboembolism, but the valve durability, the rates of reintervention were much higher in the patients that had it. And the other interesting thing about it is the, you know, we talk about duration of anticoagulation. There are many patients that had multiple episodes, you know, and these, a lot of these were surgical valves, but um, so we're extrapolating a little bit, but I guess my, my sense is that we we're I think we're recognizing it more, um, because we're looking for it, because we know about it now. Um, and while it may not be associated with acute, you know, thromboembolic events, I, I, I personally have some concern about whether it may impact long-term durability and therefore may warrant anticoagulation in a lot of these patients. Um, but we're not routinely doing CTs, right? So I think we have to get better at, I mean, visualizing the leaflets is key because most of these patients most of them don't have any change in their gradient or, or any real meaningful change in their gradient. It, it may be slightly higher, but it's sort of within the, the expected variation. And so seeing the leaflets is key. And it, whenever we can see those uh, yeah, by TTE, you know, whether we can see the leaflets in some cases, or if you look at for, for color flow paucity, I, to me, that's a big one too. If you can't see the leaflets, if the color color flow doesn't fill that stent frame and you see it in multiple views, that's also suspicious that there might be an abnormal leaflet or leaflet not moving. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And do you favor using a CT for that or more TEE to assess for leaflet dysfunction? Yeah, so with the in the aortic position, we probably use a little more CT. It, I think between our, our our practice, there's probably mixed. I mean, some still like T, but I think it, particularly in the aortic position, I think C, CT is a little better. In the mitral position, I, I still like T. I think we see the leaflets so well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. And obviously with CT, you don't have to do conscious sedation or anything like that. So that's nice. Mm -hmm. We got a question from the audience um, from Bharat Patel, one of the sonographers, asking, you know, for for institutions that don't routinely do TAVRs but come across a patient with a TAVR valve, what are some of the things that you recommend that they evaluate for and report in the echoes? So it would be many of the same measurements that we use for any prosthetic aortic valve, actually. I mean, I think some of the keys are, are what Mahesh um, alluded to, which are consistency in the measurements. So particularly the LVOT measurement is an important one where you're basically looking for the ventricular edge of the stent and, and you mostly measure outer to outer uh, edge of the stent frame. And then you also have to be careful with the LVOT TVI as well, because uh, the LVOT TVI often for a lot of these stents, there's a little bit of flow acceleration in the in the in the sort of basal or ventricular edge of the stent, and so typically we'll walk back that pulse wave Doppler until a lot of that flow acceleration goes away and it looks a little bit more laminar. Um, so the measure the measurements themselves are actually virtu virtually I mean, very much the same as most prosthetic aortic valves. Um, the, it's just the technique to remember the LVOT measurement that what, what Mahesh showed, and then understanding that there's going to be a little bit of flow acceleration within the stent frame, and so you want to try to back off that LVOT pulse wave Doppler for the for the LVOT TVI. I, I welcome any other comments too from the from the panel. 
I would say also reporting uh, both valvular and power paravalvular leak. So, you know, we do see more paravalvular leak with the with these stented valves than with uh, prosthetics. And so clarification on, you know, how much valvular and then how much paravalvular leak I think is important because it does determine the method of treatment as well. Tiffany, any, anything else? No, I think you, you both highlighted, I think, um, most of the important things. Um, So um, I think, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of our, our talk and, you know, I just wanted to thank you all for, for joining in. Um, I don't know if you have any final comments. No, I thought, I thought this was a fantastic uh, thing and I appreciate it, Lucy, for the invitation. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that was, and thank yeah, you thank for, you all so for much. joining in. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Tiffany and, and Mahesh, appreciate it, yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Luke. I, I wanted to take, um, you know, the final moments in the lecture series just to say that um, our final lecture in the Structural Heart mini-series will be on the topic of tricuspid valve intervention. And because of the Labor Day holiday, it's going to be scheduled on Tuesday, September 7th, uh, from 7 to 8 Eastern Standard Time. And so, again, just wanted to note the, the day change. Usually it's on Mondays, but our next lecture will be on Tuesday. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it uh, and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.